Okay. Um, all right. Thanks for coming. I'll, um, I'll, I'll begin. So uh, today we will continue on uh, our study on the cubitization. Uh, this will be the last two lectures on cubitization. Um, okay. So let's talk about what we discussed so far. So we talked about quantum signal processing and quantum signal processing was a, a simple statement about a two by two matrix. And it said that um, basically there is a one-to-one -one equivalence relation between a set of unitaries, which can be generated this way and the set of unitary two by two unitaries, uh, which are of this form. So here P, P of A and Q of A were some polynomials of A, uh, which satisfied some nice properties. So I, I will not uh, review what those properties were, but uh, basically um, any uh, sequence of unitaries of this form can be written as a two by two unitary like this. And conversely, given any two by two unitary uh, such that P of, a, P of A and Q of A satisfy certain constraints, uh, you can, there, there exists a uh, ang set of angles, psi zero to psi d, phi d, such that uh, this, inequal this equality holds. And the key thing about the cubitization was that somehow uh, we can leverage this fact to implement an arbitrary uh, polynomial transformation of the Hamiltonian like this. Okay, and that's all great. Um, and uh, we also discussed that uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, the cubitization um, will look like this. So instead of um, performing a sequence of Z rotation and X rotations, you perform a single a sequence of single qubit Z rotations and this uh, unitary encoding of the Hamiltonian. And with this picture, we could very easily estimate the cost of the quantum algorithm by uh, 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 in the leading order. Uh, this was uh, basically cost of U of H times the degrees of degree of the polynomial. And uh, the crucial uh, object here was what we uh, called as the unitary encoding. And um, we had a, a rather explicit formula for that. So given a uh, permission operator H such that um, this is normalized. So the, it's spectral norm is uh, small or equal to one. Uh, we could define a unitary like this, which is first of all, a unitary and we could uh, view it also as a block diagonal matrix like this. And in this, <clears throat> in today's lectures, we're gonna revisit this unitary encoding because what we discussed was useful for understanding how uh, cubitization works, but uh, this model of unitary encoding of the Hamiltonian is uh, somewhat too restrictive for practical purposes. So we're gonna uh, uh, consider a generalization, which is in fact a version of the unitary encoding that people uh, use in um, papers that are being written uh, these days. Um, so there are uh, two potential issues with this. Uh, first is that the, uh, the ancillary system uh, is just a single qubit. And this is very conceptually nice uh, because you can write down this very explicit formula for U of H, but sometimes um, it might be actually difficult to construct a unitary encoding while uh, just keeping the number of ancilla qubits to be one. So th this is a, a one restriction uh, that that will be uh, somewhat impractical. And the second thing is, um, um, if you think about what we did last time, um, the important thing was this. So if we apply U of H to this particular state, zero A uh, lambda S, then this led to uh, this formula plus square root of one minus lambda square, um, some, let's say phi where this is orthogonal to that state. 
But uh, we didn't really care about what this phi was, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, what we only ended up using was what's at the uh, top uh, left corner of this two by two block matrix. So it seems kind of wasteful to specify all these uh, unused matrix elements. Uh, I mean, like uh, it, as long as U of H is unitary, it seems like um, we, we have more freedom to choose and maybe that'll make our life easier in actually constructing U of H. And indeed, uh, these considerations are actually uh, not, not just hypothetical ones. Uh, these, these, are, uh, actually, these would be actual concerns if you were to uh, implement U of H in practice. So this motivates a more relaxed definition of the unitary encoding, which is uh, the actual version that people are using. Well, uh, almost, um, uh, well, I'll tell you more about that, but let, let's say this is the actual version that people are using. So what you demand here is uh, the following. So think of G as some fixed state, which can be a, um, a state over more than one qubit. So in our previous lecture, this G of A was simply the zero state of a single qubit. And uh, uh, in today's lecture, uh, G of A will be some uh, fixed state on uh, K qubits. So obviously uh, we don't want K to be too large, but um, um, it's, uh, the, the point is we allow G to be not just some, not just a zero state, it'll be just some fixed state on a set of qubits. And then the second term you can see is very similar as last time. So just to compare, I'm gonna compare these with the, these like a green line. So uh, because of the normalization constraint, you get the coefficient of square root of one minus lambda square, and you have some uh, some state which is uh, orthogonal to this uh, first state, but otherwise you don't really care about what that state is. So you see that uh, we we made um, uh, we relaxed our assumptions in two different ways. Uh, one is that the ancilla no longer has to be a single qubit; it can be a let's say k qubit register where k is larger or equal to one. And uh, we, we, we can basically, um, yeah, so how should I say this? So we, uh, by writing down uh, this uh, equality, we have specified uh, this uh, matrix element. And um, I guess maybe this one too, but we haven't really specified, um, let's see, different color. So these two blue colors, so we haven't really specified those two. So uh, this is, <clears throat> and uh, so, so we can choose them to be uh, however we want, as long as the unitarity constraint is satisfied. So good, so that's what we're gonna do. And, but it turns out that if you, if this is the if this is your definition of the unitary encoding, which as I said, is more relaxed than what we had last time, then there seems to be some troubles. So, well, the the point is this. So imagine. So if, if we just replace the uh, this version of unitary encoding in the picture that we had last time, like imagine plugging that unitary encoding into this picture. So in general, you're gonna apply U of, U of H more than once. Uh, in fact, many times if you're doing some interesting calculation. And the thing is, uh, if you apply U of H once, then uh, that's okay because U of H applied to this state is just, Spanned, uh, it's it's some state that is spanned by uh, this g lambda and g lambda per. So this is what I what I will call as g lambda. But if you apply u of h twice, then mm, trouble starts to emerge because 
Imagine if you apply this to g lambda, and then the first term is phi because you have u get lambda times u of h applied to g lambda. And this is okay. Uh, okay in a sense that the state is still in the span of uh, this g lambda and g lambda perp perpendicular, but uh, you get this extra state. Right, and um, well, it's it's really not clear uh, what what this state will be. I mean, um, so if you apply u of h three times, then maybe uh, you're get, you're going to get terms like u of h square applied to g lambda perpendicular, and in principle, uh, you might just uh, escape this uh, uh, two dimensional subspace, which is spanned by g lambda and g lambda perpendicular. And maybe that's okay because I mean, potentially, maybe that's okay if you know exactly what this g lambda perpendicular is. But in general, it'll be kind of difficult to know what, what those things are. So that's a problem. And to avoid this problem, um, in a paper by, uh, let's say, Lo and Chuang, 2016 paper, uh, they propose what they call it as the iterate of H. Um, let me just remark uh, our uh, definition is. Uh, slightly different from Lo and Chuang in a sense that WH of our uh, definition of WH is WH defined by Lo and Chuang times some uh, extra unitary, which they specify. But um, I, I'm just going to uh, stick with this uh, different definition because I think it's uh, slightly more convenient in light of uh, the discussion we had last time. Okay. So I'm just going to uh, say, um, say that we need a unitary W of H such that um, if you apply uh, W H uh, to this G lambda uh, perpendicular, uh, we still get some uh, state that is in the span of uh, g lambda and g lambda perpendicular. Um, so that will uh, at least solve uh, one of our problems. Okay. And I'm going to argue that by unitarity, to, to ensure that, it suffices to show that WH on this uh, two-dimensional subspace reduces to a two-by-two two unitary uh, operator. The keyword here is unitary. And the reason is um, very simple. So let's consider the easier case. So without loss of generality, let's uh, consider the action of this operator on uh, this two-dimensional subspace. So we can, of course, apply these to the basis vectors. So if you apply WH to G lambda by our assumption, we get lambda g lambda plus square root of one minus lambda square g lambda perpendicular. So um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna uh, re keep like writing this a s again. Uh, a means ancilla, uh, s means systems, means system. Um, I'm just gonna drop them because um, frankly, they're not doing much work here. Um, and then we're gonna apply this wh to G lambda perpendicular. And obviously, uh, we don't know exactly uh, what that is. So I'm just going to write down the most general possibility. Uh, let's see. I think the lambda should be inside the bracket. OK, so we have alpha G lambda and beta uh, G lambda perpendicular plus, let's say, gamma. Uh, let's say g lambda tilde, because uh, I, I don't know what to uh, specify that. 
So the thing is, um, on this two-dimensional subspace, uh, WH uh, acts like follows. So I'm going to use this convention. So two by two matrix acting on G lambda and G lambda perpendicular. Okay, so we just write down these matrix elements. And um, if we demand, uh, if WH uh, um, on the subspace, by, by which I mean this two by two matrix, if this is unitary, then uh, the two rows um, say here, here, these two rows must be orthogonal to each other. Um, and therefore, um, we get this linear constraint. And uh, of course, um, the it's a unitary. So if you apply U dagger, you gotta you know have to have identity. And it turns out that um, with these two constraints combined, the most general solution you can get is the following. It's so this phi is an arbitrary phase. And beta is minus lambda e to the i phi. Okay, uh, it's a simple simple lin systems of linear equation, and uh, I, I I encourage you to verify. Um, the point is this: so uh, in that case, uh, we we are led to the conclusion that if you apply w h to g lambda perpendicular, we get uh, that state and minus lambda plus gamma, that thing. But the thing is, remember a WH in the entire Hebrew space was a unitary. So the norm on the left hand side is one. And this guy, well, well G lambda and G lambda perpendicular, they're orthogonal to each other. So this guy's norm is one. So by unitarity, uh, well, this guy's norm must be zero. So gamma must be zero. Uh, so we can see that, well, I mean, I guess it's intuitively obvious. So if you consider some subspace and if you apply some unitary and uh, if you preserve the norm in that subspace, then obviously you won't be able to leak um, um, into the orthogonal subspace. So, um, to achieve what we wanted, uh, which is that if you apply WH to G lambda and G lambda perpendicular, um, you 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 get this. Uh, you're you're still in the same subspace. In other words, you get a you have an invariant subspace. Uh, you see that it suffices to simply uh, ensure uh, this uh, identity. Okay. So, any questions so far? If not, I will continue. Okay, so at this point, I want to compare um, what we had in the last slide with what we did last time. So the most general form of WH that we wanted was this one. Uh, so, and um, this is um, a rotation, like a two by two rotation matrix that I told you uh, in the last lecture, which uh, occurred in um, cub cubitization, uh, at, at least for this uh, toy version of cubitization. So you can see that uh, there, there are some similarities. I mean, if uh, phi is zero, then, well, okay, so maybe this is not the, best uh, notation. 
maybe I, I, I call this W lambda of H. In any case, uh, in that case, W lambda of H is equal to R lambda. So uh, something similar is going on here. And um, we'll, but, and, and then we'll see um, how, how uh, we can uh, find the connection between the two uh, more explicitly. Okay, so uh, at this point, I would like to um, ask the following question. So what is, um, how do we ensure um, um, this identity? So at first, you may think that uh, this is a very difficult problem, but it turns out that it, it's actually much simpler than what you might think. So let's recall uh, first the definition of W of H. W of H is, uh, well, if you apply that to G lambda, Uh, you get the linear combination of these two states. So, uh, well, the, the first two equations are already determined. So this is obviously lambda, and this is obviously uh, square root of one minus lambda square. Uh, but the third and the fourth one is, is less clear. Oh, and uh, just to be extra clear here, so the basis that we're choosing here is G lambda, G lambda per G lambda and G lambda perpendicular. Okay, good. So, but, but actually it turns out that you can um, somewhat, um, so it's not like you can uh, find a closed form expression because uh, that, that would be ridiculous because we haven't even defined WH in full, but we can find a more succinct condition um, uh, from which uh, you, you can ensure um, this identity. And the trick is the following. So the trick is to simply rewrite G lambda perpendicular in terms of uh, WH and G lambda. So you can very easily see that this is actually equal to lambda i. So that's the okay. So no, nothing crazy there. So now, but now the funny thing is, we can actually compute this entire thing uh, to to some degree. So if we simply plug in this G lambda perpendicular here, you get this prefactor, one, uh, one over square root of one minus lambda square. And let's see, we get G lambda uh, WH square G lambda minus lambda G lambda, WH, G lambda. So that's equal to this thing minus, uh, let's see. So that's lambda square because of uh, this relation. Okay. So, what, uh, so what we find here is that uh, this this must be square root of one minus lambda square e to the i phi corresponding to this guy. What about uh, this term? Okay, corresponding to this. Let me just. Yeah, make sure that 
the color is consistent. And for that, well, it's the same story. You just uh, plug in this definition of G, uh, G lambda perpendicular. So if we do that, then we get the factor of uh, square root of one minus lambda squared squared. So that's one divided by one minus lambda squared. And uh, this is slightly more complicated, but it's still not too bad. So let's see, the first term is G lambda. So WH dagger, WH, WH. So that's WH. And now uh, I'm gonna consider lambda I, lambda I term. So that's lambda square, G lambda, G lambda. And now I'm gonna consider the cross term this guy and that guy. So get a minus sign. Oh, actually, so here I made a mistake. So there should be a WH in the middle. Okay, so back to the third term, we get uh, minus G of lambda, mm -hmm. WH dagger, uh, let's see. WH dagger, WH, I. So that's identity times lambda. Okay. Lastly, this term and that term. So that's minus lambda, G lambda, WH square, G lambda. Okay. So yeah, we're almost done. And this ends up being. Uh, the first term is lambda. The second term is uh, lambda cube. The third term is minus lambda. And the last term is minus lambda. That. So we can simplify a little bit further. Lambda, lambda square minus. And we need this thing to be minus lambda i phi. And that is this red bar. And it turns out that there's only, there's a unique solution that satisfies all these equations. And that turns out to be, uh -huh. let's see. Maybe I like to use a different color. Right. So that inequality, that inequality gives a unique solution. And that is y must be zero and uh, this w h square um, expectation value uh, with respect to G lambda should be equal to one. Okay, so it's it's kind of a nice little fact. Um, and again, all, all we're doing is just uh, doing like linear algebra over uh, two dimensional vector space. So what we see is that really uh, all, all we really need are our two conditions. So Given this uh, WH, well, remember, we assume that um, applied to this guy, we get G lambda G lambda plus one squared one minus lambda squared G lambda, G lambda perpendicular. So we get this one. And on top of that, it, in order to ensure that uh, the, um, the, the G lambda, uh, the, the subspace, spanned by G lambda and G lambda perpendicular is the invariant subspace of WH, it suffices to just uh, in, ensure that uh, these two conditions, okay? So that's a very uh, simple fact uh, that will be uh, extremely useful.
So let's recall what we did last time. So last time um, we discussed a more toy version of periodization. And there I just uh, declared that the unitary encoding is this one. U of H is ZA tensor H plus XA tensor square root of I minus H square. But if you think about it, uh, this is just uh, one viable example of WH, but not the only possibility. To see why, well, uh, let's recall two things. Uh, U of H uh, applied to, let's see, zero lambda was actually equal to lambda uh, times zero lambda state plus square root of one minus lambda square. Uh, let's see, some state which is orthogonal. So here it really, uh, G on A is zero. And um, this, you know, G lambda perpendicular is just the state phi. Okay. And moreover, uh, what we showed last time is that if you square U of H, then this is actually equal to identity. And this actually played a, uh, a, a crucial role in our derivation. And therefore, uh, obviously, if you take the expectation value of u of h square to uh, g lambda, then you just get one. So indeed, u of h we discussed last time is one example of wh, uh, which satisfies the key conditions we discussed in the previous slide. But you can see that the condition that we discuss is a uh, much more flexible generalization of this uh, U of H, because you no longer need to assume that this U of H has this uh, specific uh, form. Uh, all you really need is to ensure that, um, yeah, uh, this uh, equation holds. And of course, uh, the equation that is analogous to this one also holds. So that's good, but um, there is one thing that we haven't discussed, and it's 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 the following. So it turns out that it is usually um, let's see. It is usually easy to come up with U of H such that U of H apply to Lambda A. Uh, sorry, G A lambda S is equal to that plus G lambda perpendicular. However, it is um, not straightforward. So let's call that as condition one. It is not sort of to stay forward to come up with U of H uh, such that uh, such that condition one is satisfied. And that's important. And um, and uh, U of H square um, is the expectation value of that uh, with respect to G lambda is equal to one. So uh, and uh, to to ensure that uh, the the action of U of H is uh, had. Um, 
to, to ensure that G lambda and G lambda perpendicular um, spans the invariant subspace of U of H, uh, the second condition was crucial. So to, to actually uh, make use of this condition that we had the, uh, uh, that we did a lot, lot, lot of job uh, deriving, uh, we need to do a little bit of extra work. And that's, um, that, and what we need to do is to somehow given U of H, we need to be able to implement W of H such that um, uh, somehow this condition is satisfied. And if we square W of H and then take the expectation value with respect to G lambda, then we'll, we need to, uh, then, then we get one, okay? So that's uh, what we need to do. Um, but uh, any questions so far on what we did? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you uh, how this works. So how do you uh, construct uh, WH actually? So the goal is to given U of H uh, construct W H um, and uh, remember that uh, this uh, ancillary state G of A uh, it's uh, you you actually need an ability to uh, prepare that state as well so here. Uh, we need to construct WH and its um, corresponding state, let's say G prime A. Such that WH applied to G prime A, which may or may not be equal to G of A, um, satisfies this relation. Again, a prime and W H square G lambda prime G lambda prime is equal to one. So G lambda prime here is just G prime A lambda S. Okay. So I'm gonna show you how this is being done. So first, let me tell you about the W of H. So I'm gonna draw a circuit diagram for W of H. And it turns out that to implement W of H, it suffices to introduce just one extra qubit. So one extra qubit. So I'm gonna, let's call it as Q. That's one extra qubit. And let's see. So, and this will be, uh, and down here, this will be the Hilbert space that the U of H acts on. So I'm, I, I won't really specify by its name, but uh, just think of it as, um, yeah, the system that you want, uh, the, it includes the system that you want to simulate and also the ancilla uh, that is used in constructing U as well. And it turns out that WH has a very simple structure. So um, I We'll tell you what these diagrams all mean. Just need to add one extra thing here and change the color. Yes. Okay, so this is the construction of W of H. So what, what is this diagram? Well, first of all, uh, for the simple thing in the middle, this is just a Pauli X operator on a single qubit. 
So it just maps the zero state to one and vice versa. So what about these two gates? So whenever you see a circuit diagram like this and you see a, blob dot, a black dot like this, it means that um, you're applying a controlled operation. So to be more specific, like if you apply, um, yeah, so maybe I will focus for, for the moment on this part, okay? And that part basically implements the following operation. So if let's say you have an arbitrary state psi here, and then the state becomes just zero psi. So if, if, if the first qubit, uh, the extra qubit is in the zero state, you do nothing. But if the extra qubit is, is in one state, then you do something, and that something is u of h. And similarly, um, I'm sure at this point you figured out what, what happens here. Uh, over this part, you're simply, uh, if you apply, um, yeah, if you begin with the zero size state, then you do nothing. If you begin with the one size state, then you apply uh, U inverse. Okay. All right, so, okay. So I, I guess, so we need to really show two things. So one is um, this fact. And the second is, uh, is this fact. When you square it and take the expectation value, it becomes one. So in this case, the second fact is actually easier to show. So I'm just gonna, uh, this, this would be like proof by drawing. Uh, See. Maybe proof by copying or something. So imagine applying this twice, okay? And then you see that this is a controlled, well, over here, this is an inverse of that because if you have like a zero state, um, then you apply nothing, so nothing happens. If you uh, stick in a one state here, you apply UH dagger and UH, so these two things cancel out. So these two cancel out, uh, these two also cancel out, and for the same reason, these two cancel out. So uh, this is WH square, and that's clearly just an identity. So that, that was very easy. Um, what's somewhat less clear is um, this fact, but uh, it'll be somewhat easy to show once we do some uh, arithmetics. And for this, uh, we actually haven't uh, done a complete job in explaining um, everything because uh, you see, we have introduced this one extra qubit, right? This one extra qubit. And um, it turns out that this extra qubit needs to be initialized in a very specific state. And uh, we need to explain uh, how that is being done. So it turns out that G prime that you use is uh, the following simple state. So this Q is in a simple superposition state of zero plus one. And um, there's a, let's see. Remember there was a G of A um, associated with U of H, right? So it's, it's the same G of A. So given uh, this extra ancillary register and defining U of H, you simply add one extra qubit. And now you have defined this uh, new thing. So why does this work? So we can maybe the next, on Thursday, I'll talk about it, but um, uh, maybe it's Wednesday over there, but uh, for, for now, let's just uh, focus on the arithmetics. Okay, so I will just apply this directly.
So without loss of generality, I will assume that I'm in the energy eigenstate lambda. So so lambda. Yes, so that's the initial state, and we apply W of H. And let's see. So remember, uh, this was WH. So let's see what happens. So, okay, so first stage. Uh, we apply, uh, um, yeah, okay, so circuit diagram, you start from the right. Um, yeah. it, it depends on the convention. It turns out that for this particular purpose, it's not going to matter too much. But um, yeah, let's, let's just uh, start from this. Uh, well, yeah, let's just start from that side. In that case, we get over a square root of two. Mm -hmm. If you have zero, you apply nothing. Then uh, let's see. And if you apply, and if you're in the one state, then you do apply UH of dagger G on the S. And I'll simply state this fact without proving it. If you are curious, do, do ask me a question. But if you <clears throat> apply this U of H to this state, it turns out that it's um, uh, that action is equal to uh, this one. So the, when it comes down to the action of U of H or U of H dagger on this G lambda state, uh, they, they, they behave in the same way. And the next step, so, so let's say this is stage one, two, and three. So that was step one. And step two, you simply apply a poly X operator. So that should be the zero state. And lastly, if you apply, oh, actually, so uh, it looks like I, I haven't completed this, right? So there is a uh, plus one Q square root of one minus lambda square, G lambda perpendicular, yes. So we should have, that state. And now uh, in the final step, if we apply this thing, um, now you see that um, with this register is one and these register are in the zero state. So in the one case, you apply the, uh, the control unitary. So that gives rise to, mm -hmm. plus square root of one minus lambda square. Let's see, so this, uh, yeah, so I need to differentiate these two. It's some state which is orthogonal. And that is uh, nothing but uh, precisely
that state plus uh, some junk state, which is uh, orthogonal to this state. So, well, um, yeah, so uh, I mean, just for concreteness, uh, I'm just going to write this down as square root of one minus lambda square g lambda perpendicular mm, double prime or something. So what you see is that you begin with an initial ancillary state, um, that thing, and you apply these sequence of operations and you, 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 you got back your original ancillary state and you ended up applying the desired operation that you, that you wanted, which was just um, uh, applying this Hamiltonian H, which on this particular eigenstate just uh, amounts to giving you an extra scalar factor of lambda. So uh, this way, you can um, actually uh, create uh, the desired WH operation using uh, a single qubit poly X operator, and the control unit un, uh, u of h and uh, its uh, inverse. So we're almost done. So uh, the, the upshot of all of this was that um, in the previous lecture, we had a rather specific form of u of h, which was last time. This was this operator, but now um, given a very flexible version of U of H, we can construct um, U of a, uh, W of H, which essentially achieves the same rule. But the worry that you may have is that uh, these Zs, uh, they, they may not um, be a single qubit operator. So you might think that this is a problem. So remember, the last time, uh, the extra, uh, these, these phase, gate, phase gates that we're applying, these were applied on this like a single ancillary qubit. But now the ancillary qubit, uh, well, it's not just a single qubit, it can be like a collection of qubits. So you might be worried, uh, maybe uh, this z of phi zero, z of phi one, z of phi two, these may become a very complicated operation. But it turns out that this is not the case. And again, the fact that uh, these um, unitary encodings, wh is the dominant class, uh, this still remains the same. And the reason, if you think about it, is very simple. Because uh, by our construction, WH was constructed in such a way that we always live in the lambda subspace. So uh, assuming that the, the, um, the state of the system is the eigenstate of WH, uh, it, we are effectively living in a two-dimensional subspace. So in a way, even though this ancillary system, uh, it, it's not, not just a qubit, uh, once we fix lambda, uh, it's as if we're always uh, having an ancillary system that acts like a qubit. Okay. So all we need to do is impl simply implement this uh, Z A of phi such that uh, it accrues a phase of e to the i phi on this target state. And in any orthogonal complement, it just uh, acts trivially. So that's, um, yeah. And let me remark that uh, the implementation of such operation is indeed actually very uh, straightforward and uh, easy. So what we need to do is to, uh, as I said, apply this uh, generalization of the single qubit operator in which uh, you accrue a phase of that uh, for G, but otherwise um, it doesn't really accrue anything. And the simplest way to, uh, maybe not the simplest way, but uh, a, 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 a very simple way to do this is to assume that you have this uh, unitary 
So suppose you have uh, a unitary V such that if you apply V on a particular state, or let's say all one state, then you get this um, uh, desired state, okay? Of course, that just means that if we apply V inverse, to G of A, we get the all one state. And the idea is, is the following. So suppose, yeah. So what you, what you first do is that you apply V of dagger. And what you do is that you apply a uh, gate called Toffoli gate. And what this does is that if you apply uh, a Toffoli gate uh, from these qubits to this single qubit, uh, let's call it as an extra qubit, let's say Q prime, then it becomes a one state followed by one. So the basic logic is that uh, if all the qubits in A is one, then you apply, then you flipped this last bit. But otherwise, uh, you don't do anything. Let's see. If x is not equal to the all one state. So you apply the Toffoli gate, and if it's one, uh, you apply phase operation on Q prime. And then um, you just apply Toffoli inverse and apply um, the V. And this way, uh, what you end up with, what you can easily find uh, is that if you apply this entire operation to G of A, you do get this phase factor. But for any other state, which is orthogonal, this G of A, uh, you just accrue a trivial phase. And this operation uh, is easy insofar as uh, V is easy. So Toffoli gate on N qubits, uh, that can be implemented by a number of gates that is linear in N. So that's a very modest cost. And the phase operation here is just a single qubit operation. So it's also something very modest. On the other hand, uh, this operation V, which maps a fixed quantum state, uh, all, zero, all zero state or all one state to an arbitrary quantum state is usually the costly one. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, I'm running a little late, but uh, we're halfway there. So I think this is a good time to take a rest and uh, take some questions. Let's see. Let's see. So how about uh, we reconvene in one minute? Um, so I'll just get my water and uh, I'll be back soon. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. yes. Uh, so how important is the condition that G part is perpendicular to, um, uh, can you go back to like the slide three or something like that? Can you... 
I can remember the notation. Uh, maybe next next one. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. So there, how important is the condition where g lambda perp is perpendicular to g that g tensor g uh, lambda? Uh, it's it's not very important because in in almost all cases, um, um actually uh, I, I'm not aware of any situation where this causes a problem. So you usually you don't really need to know uh, exactly what this G lambda perpendicular is. Yeah, may, maybe with some uh, explicit examples, this, this will be more obvious. And, and, and we will discuss some examples actually. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so let's begin again. So, right, so the, the good news now is that although we did a lot of work, uh, I think it, it was worth it because now we have a much more flexible framework for cubitization. And while uh, retaining uh, all of its nice properties that we discussed last time. So last time what we discussed was a toy model. And uh, the, 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 the final picture that I showed to you is very similar to what I showed you here, uh, except this Z last time was single qubit unitaries. Now it's just a no, N. This is the last, it's not the fourth time. This was a N qubit unitary. Also. Yeah, this was a N qubit unitary, now it's a N qubit unitary operator, which is uh, nevertheless very easy to implement. And this WH is still the dominant cost. And although this is not exactly the unitary encoding that we, uh, the, at least the, not exactly the most flexible version of unitary encoding, it is related to uh, the, the flexible unitary encoding in a very simple way. So the total cost is roughly speaking in the leading order is the cost of this WH times the degree of the polynomial. And the cost of WH is two times the cost of the control U of H. And whenever you have a unitary, well, uh, let's say you have a unitary, which is a sequence of gates like this, then the control unitary is very easy to construct. It's simply uh, let's say this is a control qubit. All you need to do is to for each gate uh, just add the sector line. So that you change the unitary gates to the control unitary gates. And because uh, all these gates are um, simple unitary operations, uh, you end up uh, causing like a constant factor um, uh, blow up in, in the cost, uh, like maybe like two or three or something. So this, in most practical cases, turns out to be just like some small constant times the cost of implementing U of H. So uh, indeed, um, we, we still retain the nice property of the cubitization that uh, even for practical purposes, um, uh, it, it, it's very, uh, it's very uh, practical. Good. 